Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nuddle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are going to investigate yet another market efficiency test that is a refinement and a generalization of the simple variance ratio test we have investigated in one of the previous videos. So if this is the simple homoscedastic law and McKinley variance ratio test you're looking for, please check this video out first. However, without further ado, let's look at the generalization. Well, we all know how the usual variance ratio test looks like. It calculates variances of cumulative Q day returns, so returns over some time periods of two days, three days, four days, and so on and so forth. Most uh, commonly, you choose powers of two in the simple conventional variance ratio test so that you can implement few tests but capture some rich dynamics. You can test for the variance uh, of returns of 2 days, 4 days, 8 days, 16 days, 32 days, 64 days, and so on and so forth. And uh, today we'll stop at 64. So if you assume that the variance of the return in every single day is roughly constant, so there is no volatility clustering, there are no uh, volatility persistence effects, and so on and so forth, then you can just calculate the variance of your variance ratio and the standard error for your test statistic that could be later converted to a Z stat to retrieve the p-value using this simple formula, where Q is the length of your subperiod, so 2 for a 2-day cumulative return variance, 64 for 64 uh, cumulative return variance, and uh, N is the total sample size. And uh, today we will, as usual, test for market efficiency using the variance ratio test for the S&P 500 over the five-year period from end of March 2016 until the end of March 2021. And we have 1,258 returns, as usual, corresponding to five years. However, if returns are, are heteroscedastic, if volatilities are clustered, if they're not constant across the period, then this test does not capture autocorrelation properly, because the null hypothesis, that is, this variance ratio being not equal to zero or significantly different from zero, the null hypothesis violations can occur due to either autocorrelation or heteroscedasticity. So if you have got a significant test result, then you cannot be 100% sure that it is indeed autocorrelation. It can be just heteroscedasticity hiding under the significant result of yours. So Law and McKinley actually themselves proposed a modification of the test to capture heteroscedasticity and test for autocorrelation only. However, it has been further refined and popularized by the 1993 paper of Chow and Denning. And by the way, if you're interested in reading those papers for yourself, I have got uh, those PDFs, if they're publicly available, uploaded to the Google Drive. So you can refer to all of these papers at once to aid your studies. But without further ado, let's study the formulas that Law and McKinley proposed in 1988 for the heteroscedastic case. First of all, they noticed that the variance ratio can be expressed as weighted uh, autocorrelations of returns over larger and larger time periods. So it can be expressed as a weighted sum. For a variance ratio over Q periods, it would be a weighted sum from J equals 1 to Q minus 1. So if you are doing four day cumulative return variances, you would be able to test for the weighted sum of autocorrelation coefficients up to period three. And they will be weighted according to this quite simple structure. So it means that you have a direct relationship between variance ratio and autocorrelation, which is again useful in terms of interpreting the test results. However, what can it be also useful for is to retrieve the variance of your variance ratio in the heteroscedasticity case. So what Law and McKinley used is that they expressed the variances of each and every of these autocorrelation coefficients in terms of returns and their squares and their products, 
Over here, this bulky formula measures the variance of uh, jth uh, autocorrelation. So it means autocorrelation of order j, meaning that you can have variance of your autocorrelation coefficient of order 1. So just one day ahead, you can have two day ahead autocorrelation, three day ahead, and so on and so forth. And here, we'll test for uh, autocorrelation of order at most 63, because we're testing for order 63 correlation, because we're considering our uh, variance ratio up until day 64. And then we can use this weighting procedure, which basically just uses the fact that uh, this variance can be calculated as the sum of variances of individual uh, autocorrelation coefficients. And uh, here we can retrieve that similarly to how we do it in the case of homoscedasticity. However, the formula is quite a bit more bulky. And uh, another uh, computational uh, difficulty that you might encounter in the heteroscedastic case is that if you want to test for uh, the variance ratio up until 64 day cumulative returns, you would need to implicitly calculate variance ratios and those delta statistics, which are variances of autocorrelation, for each and every uh, cumulative return window Q up until 64. So it means this test quite a bit more computationally intensive. But let's try and figure that out. Well, first of all, let's remember how to calculate the usual homoscedastic uh, variance ratio test. Uh, we, we first of all just calculate the variances of cumulative returns over uh, one-day periods, two-day periods, three-day periods, and so on and so forth. Uh, if here, we calculate those cumulative returns by uh, carefully using the index function alongside the product function. So here, we just tell the formula to multiply one plus an array of returns of respective length. So here, we would multiply arrays of length one, so quite trivial. Here, we would multiply arrays of length 4, given the fact that 4 is over here in this particular cell, and so on and so forth up until 64. And the condition at the start allows us to fill the 63 last observations here with uh, blanks, simply because we don't know what is the cumulative return for the 64-day period over here, as these days haven't yet happened. So this careful uh, formula allows to account for all possibilities and calculate those cumulative returns, variances of which we are calculating over here. And now we can remember our null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is that under the random walk hypothesis, if returns are independent, then we should have the uh, variance ratio of Q day variance divided by Q times daily variance equal to 1. So if we subtract 1, we will have a test statistic deviations from zero of which we can assess for significance. And that's exactly what we do. Each time for each of our period Q, we divide the variance of cumulative returns for Q days over Q times, so here two times, daily variance and subtract one. And we see that our variance ratios are predominantly negative and they remain negative across all 63, so from two until 64, uh, Qs. And it means that the aggregated weighted autocorrelation function is indeed negative, meaning that the returns of S&P 500 are anti-persistent. However, is this deviation from zero statistically significant? To assess that, we as usual just calculate our homoscedastic variance and then convert it into the standard error by taking the square root of it. So here is just dependent on the length of the subperiod Q and the total number of observations N. And we can see that our Z stats, which are figured out just as the variance ratio, the deviation from zero that we observe over its standard error, we can see that those Z stats are negative and they are quite large in magnitude. And if we convert them into p-values using the usual uh, two-tailed Z test function, normal standard distribution of the absolute value of the Z-stat, cumulative, uh, 1 minus that times 2, well, two-tailed test, we can see that those p-values start very low, and uh, later on they fluctuate around 10%, meaning that our results are indeed 
statistically significant seems to be. However, remember what I told you at the start. The homoscedastic variance ratio test can reject the null hypothesis not only if there is autocorrelation, but also when returns are not identically distributed, when there is heteroscedasticity. So let's adjust for that using the logic we have discussed a little bit earlier. So let's calculate the deltas, the variances of autocorrelation coefficients for each and every time period Q, for each and every length of our subperiods. So let's consider how the delta J, that is the variance of the autocorrelation coefficient, is calculated. Well, first of all, we have got the number of observations N, so 1258 over here, multiplied by this ratio. In the numerator of this ratio, we have got the product of two squares, the squared deviations of returns and returns lagged by J from the mean return. And here, the fact that we have D mean returns already comes in handy because we don't have to complicate our formulas even further. And we're using index functions to lag our returns properly and calculate this uh, product of squares and sum it across all possible returns. And then in the denominator, we have got a square of squared sum of simple return deviations from the mean. So it would be a square of sum squared of all returns. And enforcing this formula for all possible frequencies from 1 to 64, all potential values of Q that are represented as J's over here, we can calculate this uh, variance of autocorrelation. And now we also need to consider the weightings. The weightings can be calculated using this quite bulky yet simple matrix of size 64 by 64. And uh, here we'll need to first remember that we only are summing up those weights and those autocorrelation coefficients until q minus 1. So for q equals 2 case, we'll only need the first order autocorrelation. For uh, frequency q equals 3, we'll need the first order and the second order autocorrelation, and so on and so forth. So to implement this logic, we first check whether our order of uh, autocorrelation is uh, higher or equal to the uh, q uh, value that we're considering right now, and if it's indeed the case, then we return zero, because we don't want this to be weighted in, and if it's the case, then we'll just input this particular expression over here, which is 2 over q minus j divided by q squared, and this has actually some nice correspondence to this expression that we have got over here for the homoscedastic case. This is just, again, a generalization, and comparing these formulas uh, serves uh, a very nice purpose in terms of understanding how this comes from this. And then, having calculated those weights for the whole 64 by 64 matrix, we can calculate our standard errors for the heteroscedastic case by just uh, multiplying two vectors together. And that would be the locked fixed vector of our deltas, of our variances of autocorrelation terms, uh, multiplied, so row times column, by the column of weights. And as weights for uh, the orders of autocorrelation we don't need to pick up for this particular case as zero, this is uh, indeed uh, proceeds with the correct calculation. And then, as we uh, take the square root of this uh, mmult equation, and then we divide it by the square root of the number of observations, 1258, we achieve the standard error that can be compared to the standard error in the homoscedastic case. And that means that this standard error fits into the Z-stat calculations, you divide the variance ratio by the heteroscedastic standard error, and these uh, Z-stats can be converted into p-values using the same standard normal distribution as in the homoscedastic variance ratio test. Uh, regardless of the fact that this is a heteroscedastic test, Law and McKinley have proven that um, the asymptotic uh, distribution of such a test statistic is still normal if you go through all of this pain and calculate uh, all of these formulas. However, it's still quite tidy in Excel if you know how to implement indices and matrix multiplications. Now we can graphically see what's going on uh, in terms of the comparison of Z stats in the homoscedastic case and the heteroscedastic case across 
our range of periods. We first of all see that homoscedastic Z stats are always much lower, and in our case it means that they're much higher in magnitude than the heteroscedastic Z stats, and this again shows the importance of the assumptions that we're making in the null hypothesis. As I already mentioned, the high values of Z stats for the homoscedastic case not necessarily mean that returns are not independent, it means that they are either not independent, not identically distributed, or both. And uh, here we see that if we account for heteroscedasticity, our Z-stats are much lower in magnitude, meaning that the degree of autocorrelation, if you remove heteroscedasticity from the equation, is much lower. But how much lower? Well, in the time of Law and McKinley in 1988, you would just calculate the highest in magnitude Z-stat and figure out what the p-value is for this particular uh, q-value. However, what Chow and Denning pointed out in their 1993 paper is that such approach suffers from multiple testing, because in the heteroscedastic test you necessarily have to calculate the uh, variance ratios for a wide range of uh, q-values. It means that some of your values some of your Z stats would be significant by random chance alone. It means that your type 1 error rate, that is the false positive rate, would be much higher than uh, in the single test case. So accounting for multiple testing, what Chow and Denning proposed is to, first of all, just like in Law and McKinley, you calculate the most significant Z stat, and here it's quite simple, isn't it? Because all of our Z stat are, are negative, so we can just figure out the minimum Z stat. However, sometimes you might have both positive and negative Z stats for different periodicities. So this formula would take care of that. It would return the minimum if the absolute value of the minimum Z stat is higher than the value of the maximum Z stat. Uh, and if that's not the case, then it will return the maximum Z stat. So it will take care of uh, significant. Uh, Z statistics, high magnitude Z statistics from both sides, the positive side and the negative side. And then we can return the p-values for these most significant Z stats, and we can see that if we were doing it the Low and McKinley way, so just figuring out uh, these p-values as if they arrived from the single test, we would have rejected the null hypothesis of independence in both cases, and we would have concluded that S&P 500 is autocorrelated and that the market is inefficient. However, uh, applying the robustness test of Chow and Denning, we can account for multiple testing, remembering that these values did not come from a single test, they came from 63 different tests applied consecutively, so to account for that, Chow and Denning proposed this particular correction. And this is just a multiple testing correction procedure, one of many, there are other adjustments that I might uh, cover in further videos for general cases of hypothesis testing, so if you're interested in multiple testing adjustments, uh, please leave a like and a comment under this video. Uh, however, here the customary procedure is Chow and Denning, where you subtract 1 minus your most significant p-value to the power of the number of the tests you've taken from 1. And here we apply exactly the same logic. We subtract from 1, 1 minus our p-value to the power of 63. And we still have a significant and largely significant, less than 1%, p-value for the homoscedastic Z-stat, but the p-value becomes quite high, higher than even 50% for the heteroscedastic case. And what does it mean for market efficiency? Well, it means that if you uh, apply the usual homoscedastic variance ratio test, you would indeed have a significant result, but not due to the fact that your returns are not independent, but because they are not identically distributed. And if you account for that, if you account for heteroscedasticity and apply the modified approach and account for multiple testing in the manner of Chow and Denning, then you'll see that your result is actually not something unusual. You would be expected to see such a high Z stat if you just do 63 uh, tests on purely random data simply because of the type 1 error rate skyrocketing when you do so many tests at once. And that's all there is for the multiple variance ratio test under heteroscedasticity. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I make it to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much and stay tuned.